Welcome to this 60 minute online event meditation and mindfulness for well-being at work. Just before we start, a couple of reasons, a bit of background about why I'm doing this. Number one, this is a 60 minute condensed version of a full day workshop on the topic of you managing your well-being to reduce overwhelm and stress at work. Uh, and I have delivered this um, presentation to many organisations, to many people, and I've had many requests for recording. So rather than getting into the quagmire of GDPR, data protection and all the rest of it, um, I'm now recording this without an audience. So this uh, recording can now be shared. I have no problem with it. Of course, I have my copyright, my intellectual property um, for me having put this together but uh, there is no audience here, so I don't have to worry about damaging anybody's uh, data. OK, the other reason I'm doing this is that I'm sure you will have seen in the past couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of talk online, offline about what needs to happen to help people manage their mental health, their physical health, their general well-being, specifically at work. And I see a lot of talk, I see a lot of reports, I see, see a lot of very impressive quotes. It's OK to not be OK. Um, you know, be kind to people. You don't understand what they're going through. But as long as these stay just statements and nothing's actually being undertaken in the workplace, not much is going to change. I understand that for organisations, it is a huge challenge to begin these types of conversations, but it's also very challenging if you just stick somebody in front of a computer like you are now uh, and give them something to watch or to listen to. Conversations need to begin in the workplace and what that is going to require is for people to become vulnerable and nobody likes to feel vulnerable in the organisational context, you know, always going on about professional behaviour and getting the job done and being efficient and, and being effective and professional working relationships and all those things. And so when it comes to kind of soft skills, when it comes to um, examining a little more closely who you are and how you are responding to situations, situations and people around you, there isn't a whole lot of support. I hope that at some point that is going to change and I will continue to offer my workshops along um, the lines of supporting you and your colleagues to re bring um, who you are into the team to create a strong team culture for you to be able to um, develop strong working relationships so that you feel comfortable at work uh, because you know we all spend a long time at work and even if you're working remotely um, it's important I think to still actually enjoy what you're doing and enjoy communicating with the people that you work with. So before we begin properly, just make sure, please, that you are sitting comfortably. Ideally, you're going to have your feet both on the ground so that you're feeling grounded. Um, ideally, too, you will have turned off all uh, distractions, told people you don't want to be disturbed for the next hour or so. There is no magic wand or miracle solution. I'm going to give you some theory. I'm going to give you some practical guidance, advice, suggestions about what you can do to um, bring meditation and mindfulness into your workday so that you can be interrupt the negative um, patterns that are going on. But at the end of the day, it is entirely up to you what you decide to do with this information. So this is what we're going to be covering. We are going to look at um, why and how stress develops. I want to take the emotion out of that word stress, all those negative words, overwhelm. I want to describe to you on a neurological, physiological basis how stress actually develops. Because I think if you understand that, you will also understand um, that you are perfectly able to put those pattern interrupts to stop responding um, in certain ways to people and situations. One of the exercises I'm going to do is to ask you to think about what your personal stress triggers are, because with regards to emotional intelligence, the first step, any personal change actually has to be self-awareness. You have to understand yourself a little bit better. And then I'm going to be giving you, as I mentioned, some very practical exercises for some very simple things to do to help you reduce stress and overwhelm so that you come back from feeling that busy, stressful thing every single day. 
Now, if we haven't met before, my name is Gwyneth. I worked in international organisations for more than 20 years. I'm not a technical expert in any shape or form. Um, I was always a people person. I always was managing people. I was always there to support people. And I was lucky enough to, um, for the most part, have supervisors, have managers who actually understood the importance of having somebody else to manage the teams as opposed to just providing the technical input. So in 2011, I lost my job or my contract was terminated, as is often the case in international organisations. And quite honestly, I could not face going through another recruitment process. So rather than do that, I said, OK, I've got some savings. I'm just going to step away now and see what happens. Well, it took me the best part of two years to find out what I wanted to do. And um, you know, I got to that point myself, waking up in the middle of the night thinking, how on earth am I going to pay the bills? What am I going to do? I discovered coaching purely by chance. I qualified, I trained and um, for the past 10 years, my business, Feel Good Coaching and Consulting, I've helped literally thousands of professionals such as yourself in international organisations, sometimes in the private sector to build a powerful personal brand. Well, when I talk about personal brand, what I mean is to help people like you become familiar with who they are instead of hiding behind the job description, the um, job title, the pay grade, and to really recognize your potential so that you can potentially um, you know, prepare yourself better for interview, market yourself, speak about yourself with confidence at interview, at a presentation, just in the office. Um, you know, how do you promote yourself on an application form? But also to help you really be an integral part of the team instead of looking outwards and saying, oh, crikey, you know, these people really hard work. Um, looking at you instead and seeing what environment you best fit into, potentially making the move to somewhere different. I also deliver many, many workshops on the um, subject of, um, well, at my core, at the core of my work, it's emotional intelligence. Um, and that really is, again, it's like, you know, getting to know yourself better so that you do have a better experience at work. So why and how does stress develop? I'm going to show you some statistics in a couple of minutes that really are, they're quite shocking. And Gallup has just put out um, its new report on staff engagement, employee engagement in 2023. And in Europe in particular, the statistics have gone down. I mean, they were bad enough as they were at 15%, but now they're down to 12%, which means that, you know, almost 90% of employees right across the world are um, disengaged at some level or another. Usually, we believe, because of, you know, this, this stress, this not wanting to feel the stress anymore, not wanting to work as hard anymore, just wanting to get off the hamster wheel, that, you know, wanting to spend more time with family, doing the things that you want to do in, instead of being under pressure, still checking emails at 11 o'clock at night. So stress is a natural response that our bodies and minds have developed over thousands of years to help us deal with challenges and threats in our environment. Stress is a survival mechanism. It allowed our ancestors to react very quickly in dangerous situations, you know, such as if they encountered a predator or if they were facing physical danger. So when we face a stressful situation in the workplace, it's going to be a tight deadline, maybe a misunderstanding, an argument or a perceived threat. Maybe there's uncertainty around your job. Your body is still activating its fight or flight response in the same way. Now, this response is created by the sympathetic nervous system and the release of stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline cause a cascade of changes to prepare your body for action. First of all, your heart rate and your blood pressure increase to pump more oxygen and nutrients into the muscles, boosting your strength and your speed, which in turn helps you to respond quickly and effectively to the perceived threat. At the same time, you may notice that your breathing becomes rapid, shallow. This is getting more oxygen into your bloodstream so that you can get ready to run 
run away from this perceived threat. And in, spot, in response to stress, our brain also releases neurotransmitters that um, increase our focus and alertness. This heightened state of alertness does allow us, to, of course, to be more attentive and respond swiftly to potential dangers or challenges. Now, I just want you to think if you've ever heard, it doesn't happen very often, but there have been enough news um, items over the years about a parent or, or another human being. You know, they've seen a pushchair um, gone under a chair or a, or a car rolling towards a child or something. And by some miracle, they, they find strength inside of them that they didn't know they had and they lift the car off the child or they prevent the pushchair from going into the road. And they're surprised at themselves. They don't understand where that strength came from. Well, that is what that's that stress um, response, that fight or flight. If the stress is strong enough and the adrenaline and the cortisol push you hard enough, you have incredible strength. And then afterwards, like I said, people say, well, I've no idea how I did that. You know, can't even carry my shopping home, let alone lift a car. But so cortisol um, and adrenaline, as, as I mentioned, the, the brain sends signals for those two hormones, for the, those two chemicals to be um, released for stress. But cortisol is important as well because it helps to regulate your body's energy levels by increasing glucose in um, the bloodstream. And it's that extra energy that is vital for immediate use in stressful situations, as I just explained, you know, the parent or, or some human performing an incredible feat to save another human's life. The issue is, if you're busy all the time, if you're feeling even a low level of stress all the time, you, um, you're producing cortisol at some level all the time, so your cortisol levels are elevated, this is eventually going to lead to chronic stress, which, as you may know, can have negative effects on your physical and your mental health. So stress, absolutely no doubt, you know, can be useful in short bursts if, if there's a work deadline coming up. And I've worked with people who've told me I work much better under stress than, uh, um, you know, um, without stress. And there are other people who say, no, no, I've got to do it on Tuesday if it's due on Friday. Uh, but when your stress response is constantly activated, even in non-life-threatening situations, and let's face it, at work, in the cold light of day, a deadline coming up is not life-threatening, um, this is going to uh, contribute, as I said, to um, chronic stress. Prolonged activation of that stress response without sufficient recovery again in the long term is going to lead to mental um, unwellness and physical and psychological consequences. It's going to weaken your immune system. That's going to make you more susceptible to illness. And chronic stress, um, as I know, and I'm sure many other people do, you know, it will eventually disrupt your sleep patterns. It impacts your memory, your concentration. And again, it contributes to worse things such as anxiety, depression um, and burnout. And it's really important to note that different individuals may perceive and respond to stress differently. What one person finds stressful, another may not. What one person perceives as, as stress, oh my goodness, there's this deadline coming up. Another one will say, oh, for goodness sake, it's not the end of the world. It's not life threatening. Suck it up and get on with it. So I think one of the reasons also that people kind of step back or hesitate to bringing these conversations into the workplace even in a managed environment, is that everybody's different. And one person will say, yeah, just get on with it. Whereas another person will get into complete and utter panic um, because they don't feel that they're going to achieve uh, the deadline. So, you know, factors like genetics, your upbringing, your past experience, um, your personal coping mechanisms, all of those things influence how you interpret and handle stress. If, as I said at the beginning, if you can understand how stress actually develops, that is going to help you to take steps to manage and reduce it. And adopting stress management techniques such as, well, regular exercise, um, you know, eating properly, but also practicing mindfulness or meditation, even seeking social support, i.e. having a conversation with somebody 
All of those things can play a very important role in mitigating the negative effects of stress and promoting your overall well-being. And by recognising the impact of stress, and like I'm going to give you some statistics now, um, when you prioritise your self-care, um, make a conscious effort to create a balanced approach to managing the challenges that come up um, to you. You will also find that you become more resilient, you are more calm over a length of time, you may actually find yourself feeling quite good about being at work. And you know, my business name is Feel Good Coaching and Consulting. That's what it's about. It's about helping you to feel good about you being you. So here are those statistics I was talking about. Um, from the International Labour Organization, work related stress affects individuals worldwide with approximately 40%, 40% of workers experience excessive stress. And that is just the people who took the survey. I'm quite sure the number is higher. Gallup, you know, does a huge amount of, of research into um, people's well-being and, and, as I mentioned, staff engagement. We know that chronic stress can lead to burnout. What I didn't know was that it affects an estimated 23% of employees globally, of course, reduced productivity, of course, increased absenteeism, but 23% people experiencing burnout. Again, that is a statistic that absolutely needs to change. And the World Health Organization, well, we know this as well. High stress levels have been linked, no doubt about it, to physical and mental health conditions, cardiovascular disease, anxiety, depression, and of course, worse. So now that I've um, explained to you a little bit about what um, stress is and, um, you know, why it develops differently, um, in different people. I want to go a little bit deeper. Excuse me whilst I just have a quick drink. Thank you. Um, because as I mentioned, I want to take the emotion, I want to take away the, the anxiety and the worry and the stress out of feeling stressed or overwhelmed. Um, because if you do, if you can understand this on a neurological, physiological basis level, um, it's potentially going to make things easier for you to manage your response in the future. So when you have an emotional response to something, your brain processes the, the new information and you then begin to sense, feel good, because this works both ways, or bad. And then you have the conscious thought about that emotion. This person is making me angry, they're annoying me, um, they're being rude. And as you are thinking those things, your brain is sending a signal to release those um, hormones, those chemicals, cortisol, adrenaline and some other things, um, which then reinforce the feeling. They reinforce the emotion. That emotion in turn reinforces the thought. And so again, your brain produces another signal to say, OK, you're still feeling that. Let's give you if that's what you want to feel. I'm going to um, send you some more um, chemicals to reinforce that feeling. And the next time you see that person, you're in a similar situation um, where you have felt that negativity because of the way our bodies work, because all of this happens on automatic without us even realizing the same circle starts again. So this person may not have even opened their mouth and you're already feeling something, thinking something about them. Oh, they're so, such a rude person, they're so irritating. And the issue is that as this circuit goes around and around and around, you are creating over time, you're creating a habit. So, so thoughts um, become beliefs, uh, beliefs become habits and habits uh, then, you know, they make up our behaviour, they make up part of who we are. So if you can understand that there is this circuit going on, it's that circuit that needs to be broken. Because as long as you keep thinking, you're going to keep feeling. As long as you keep feeling, you're going to keep thinking. And as long as you keep thinking that negativity, your brain is going to continue um, to send signals to produce chemicals to reinforce the emotion you have. So this is the circuit that we actually need to break. 
Now, regrettably, um, when it comes to anything, actually, good, bad, negativity, people, um, drugs, alcohol, relationships, um, I don't know, maybe you've got uh, teenagers or, or children who want to play video games. When we are repeating something, when it becomes a habit, because our body gets so used to these chemicals being present, it becomes addictive. It is a little bit like, uh, you know, that shot of dopamine when a child is playing a video game or uh, falling in love, you know, falling in love for the first time over and over and over again. You know what I mean? That kind of oxytocin, that bonding, that wonderful um, butterflies in your tummy kind of emotion. Some people become addicted to that um, that process, that emotion. And it's the same with the negative things, unfortunately, as well. So breaking the these habits breaking these circuits again as i mentioned at the beginning change is always a challenge because you're asking your brain to change something now if i said to you for example i want you to forget about um your ability to read or i want you to forget about your ability to type or write or speak english pretty much impossible right but only because you've been doing these things for a long, long time. You've created neural pathways, which I'll come on to in a little bit. But you've created these neural pathways. And because you've thought those things, you've repeated those um, activities, those thoughts, those emotions so often, you don't even think about doing it anymore. And this is what I say, you know, and then the body just becomes um, addicted to it. And you, you're just doing it on a subconscious level. You don't even realise. So coming back to the self-awareness aspect of this, it's really, really important that you are able to identify your personal stress triggers so that you can better interrupt negative reactions and behaviours. If you keep on working on automatic, uh, if you're not paying attention to how you are feeling, then it is going to be pretty much impossible to do anything, you know, to, to change anything. So self-awareness is it is the first step to any type of personal development and it requires you to get deeply personal with yourself because we are all great at looking outwards we're all great at blaming people and situations for how we're feeling we're not so good at looking inwards and asking ourselves you know where where's that actually coming from a little bit of self-awareness maybe a little bit of self-analysis although not too much of that i don't want you to you know be asking yourself why 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 i just want you to focus on on the what so that you can um, then move forward you need to know how you are responding to people in situations and you know this is not stuff that's ta um, taught at school it's not taught at college uh, depending on what course you're doing, you might be doing it at, um, at university, but you you need to have that awareness of how you are responding to people or situations if you want to change how you feel. So for now, maybe you just want to um, press pause for this recording and take a pen and a piece of paper because you're analog, not digital. You're a fabulous an analog human being. And think about who or what sets you off. And it can be so many things. It can be traffic on the way into work. Um, it can be uh, you've just opened your laptop. You've got a meeting, um, you know, coming up in one minute and it flashes up to you that it, updates have to be installed and you need to restart now um, um, at the office. You know, if, there, if there's a kitchen and it's been left in a mess or there's no coffee left in the jug or the photocopier, maybe you've got somebody who does photocopying and they've gone on their coffee break and you can't get into the room or there's no paper. Um, somebody planting some additional work on your desk at half past two on a Friday afternoon. There are so many things that cause minor irritation, um, but those minor irritations, that, that's where it starts. And this is why you need to be aware of what they are. So I want you to write a list. And as I say, you can press pause now um, or you can decide to do it later. Maybe just keep the piece of paper next to you and pay special attention to yourself over the next couple of hours. Every conversation you have, when the phone rings, when you get interrupted, um, 
when somebody calls you into a meeting, when somebody changes a deadline, you know, there, there really are many, many things that can uh, can irritate um, you, but you don't even notice because you, you're just responding in an automatic way every single time. And after you have discovered um, who or what sets you off, ask yourself, just give yourself a quick body scan and ask yourself, where does that manifest in your body? Because again, um, as I said, the brain, first of all, processes the information, but it happens in such a tiny split second that the first time you actually become aware of feeling negative something is when you feel it, as, as I said. So, you know, some people feel a tightness in their throat or maybe you feel that you um, are clenching your fists. Maybe there's um, a quick um, thing of sciatica going down the back of your legs or your hips are hurting you or your back feels tight or your ears feel hot or you feel your heart start pounding or your stomach start churning. I grit my teeth. <laughs> I, I know I do it. Um, but, you know, I really have to catch myself. OK, I'm gritting my teeth and then have to kind of step back and take some take some breaths to interrupt that circuit. So who or what sets you off? Really, really important that you are aware. And where does it manifest in your body again so that you become more um, aware of what you're actually feeling? Now, there's a, a famous quote by Tony Robbins, if you've heard of him, many have, that says where your focus goes, energy flows. But actually, it was um, probably around 100 years ago, a chap by the name of Napoleon Hill, who was probably one of, well, if not the first author of a self-help book, um, which still sells thousands of copies today called Think and Grow Rich. And in that book, he talks about whatever you concentrate on where your focus goes, that is where you're putting all your energy. So if you focus on something that's negative, you focus on the things that are going wrong, um, that is where your energy goes. And I don't know if you've ever, you know, kind of spilt your coffee and it's like, oh, for goodness sake, I wonder what else is going to go wrong today. And you've literally just told yourself you're just waiting for other things to go wrong or getting stuck in traffic. Oh, I should have left home earlier. Oh, for goodness sake. And then you get, you know, late, late to to your meeting and somebody's fed up and it just it just messes up the entire day. But it's only messing up your day because you are thinking about the things that are going wrong. So be very aware of what you are aware of. OK, I'm just going to have another drink excuse me thank you okay so discover how to introduce mindfulness and meditation into your day to reduce stress and overwhelm now i've talked a lot about the circle the circuit um, that you know repetitive circle of behavior that you need to interrupt to reduce the amount of cortisol adrenaline and other things being pumped into um, into your body to reinforce that negativity because it will make you ill eventually and so i'm going to give you um, as a, as i said at the beginning a couple of brief exercises things that you can do at work to bring you back down to to help you bring uh, come back to the level again um, and you might find yourself getting anxious five minutes later um, and then you just stop for another 30 seconds or a minute really important it's a new habit that i'm asking you um, to develop here now i talked about uh, you know our, our neural pathways and when you have a strong emotional response to something or when you've been repeating um, a behavior or an activity for a long time you create these strong neural pathways just as you did when you learned to read when you learned to write uh, potentially when you learned how to ride a bicycle uh, learned another language all of those things now important too to understand how we actually learn um, how do we even develop memory? Now, in 1949, um, there was a psychologist by the name of Donald Hebb. And he, he's responsible for um, discovering how we remember things. Um, and the uh, another famous quote from him or that summarizes his work is that neurons that fire together wire together. 
So here you can see neurons firing and wiring together. The idea is that when neurons respond to the same stimulus time and time and time again, they make the same um, synaptic connections. There's, you know, there's little explosions, those, those synapses, they, they make those connections tiny tiny um, connections and the neurons communicate through those connections um, and create our learning create um, the memory uh, we talk about having a train of thought you know if you're thinking about something and you've got ideas coming up it's literally your neurons and uh, firing and wiring together um, to different neurons um, so that you are creating thoughts and this is exactly to how we learn because those neurons have fired and wired together time and time and time and time again so this is the second part of how your negative thoughts how stress imposter syndrome everything develops it's through re repetition and it's through those neurons firing and wiring together those synaptic connections and um, you know even if you just have a couple of neurons activated that is enough to trigger an entire um, process so it might be um, you smell something that isn't very nice and you think goodness what's that smell and all of a sudden uh, you're remembering I don't know, uh, being stuck on the motorway when your car broke down because the catalytic um, converter um, went belly up, whatever. So we can trigger stress very, very easily and very, very quickly. By the same token, though, this means that we can also trigger well-being if we want to. So when you do experience a strong emotional response to something, as I said, those synaptic connections, they are strong. When you're upset about something, when you're angry or irritated, that is when the loops start. Those little neurons, look for the neurons that they found last time and off you go. So most importantly, and regardless of what you do from here on in, please just slow down. We have several types of brain waves. The first one, the, the beta brain waves, you know, the beta state is something or the beta state, depending on how you say it, um, is a state that you're in during for most of the day. You're running, running, running. Um, and because you feel busy and stressed and there's beta brain waves, you're just busy, 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 stressed. Now, being in beta or high beta for long amounts of time is like being in your car or a car um, driving up the motorway, up the highway in first gear at 100 miles an hour from, I don't know, London to Vienna. OK, well, you wouldn't actually make it because the engine would just give up before way before you got there. But that's what you're doing to your body if you just keep going, if you're not giving yourself the time to kind of slow down and um, take some time for yourself. So the second type of um, brain waves are the uh, alpha brain waves. Now, alpha is a slightly meditative, uh, meditative, meditative, daydreamy kind of um, state. Oh, wouldn't it be fabulous if, oh, I can't wait to go on holiday. You know, when you're thinking about those slightly dreamy, lovely things, you're still fully conscious, your body is still working, but you're just having a little daydream. Then we have um, your uh, theta brain waves, and I'm going to talk about meditation. But when you when you spend more time meditating, these are micro meditations for work. There's no way you can get into theta unless you go and sit in an office or somewhere quiet for an hour. Um, but theta is when your body goes to sleep, um, but your mind is still. Uh, awake so you're still able to to focus on your breathing on the meditation on what it is you want to achieve but your body is asleep and because your body is asleep you have broken that circuit of um, of feeling and then uh, thinking again and then finally delta when you're asleep um, some people have asked me I've had the question uh, you know will meditation work will mindfulness work when I'm asleep no it won't uh, because when you're asleep uh, your brain, 
you know you, your conscious is also asleep your body's asleep um so people who put you know stick their earphones in before bedtime to do some meditation uh and then fall asleep well it's great that you're falling asleep but i don't know how effective the meditation is going to be so one tip right at the beginning before we move on is um anytime you do this ensure that you are sitting comfortably feet on the ground or potentially standing comfortably maybe looking out the window if you don't want people to know what you're doing uh, but trying to do kind of any relaxation in bed because we associate bed with uh, sleep um, it's maybe not going to be so good so mindfulness mindfulness is a fabulous way of as i said interrupting the body brain loop mindfulness is about being so you need to stop doing you need to focus on your senses so here's a very very um, short exercise that you can do so you can find uh, somewhere comfortable to sit you can do this at your desk you can potentially sit on a cushion if you want to but really important that your feet are flat on the floor, feeling grounded on the floor. Posture, you should be um, relaxed, but ensure that your spine is straight, not rigid, but um, still straight. You shouldn't be slumped in your chair. And I want you to um, focus on your breath. Now, for mindfulness, you do not need to close your eyes, but focus on your breath. Start by bringing attention to your breath and take a few deep breaths, inhaling slowly through your nose and exhaling again through your mouth. And after you've done that two or three times, pay very specific attention to the breath going up through your nostrils and follow it into your body before you then exhale again really notice the sensation of the breath where's it going how does it enter your body and where is it leaving your body be fully present no judgment no analysis just stay there with that breath following your breath in through your nose can you feel it going through your body and then where does it go to actually come out of your mouth as you exhale So after you've done that, begin to scan your body. So you're shifting your focus um, to your body and fairly quickly take a moment to mentally scan from your head to your toe. <laughs> Go down your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your chin, your throat, your shoulders your torso, your thighs, your shins, your feet flat on the ground and your toes. And as you do that, you may feel a kind of, I'm going to call it a slight heaviness in your feet. And that's because you're quite literally grounding yourself by paying attention to your body. When you come down to your feet and your feet are flat on the floor, you are very aware that you are being supported and when you know you're supported uncertainty tends to dissipate as well so now that you've grounded yourself i want you to focus on an item close to you now this can be anything it can be maybe you've got a plant in your office um, maybe it's your cup of tea or your cup of coffee i like using my cup of coffee for this and hold it in your hands or touch the plant and sense with your hands what can you actually feel what do your fingers actually feel and then listen and then smell And if you have got a cup of something in your hand, have a quick taste. And as you taste and as you swallow the liquid, where does the liquid go? Now, this type of an exercise 
can seem so simple and everybody's like well, how does that work but the fact of the matter is because you've stopped doing and you haven't got that loop going on anymore because you're focused on being because you're focused on your senses you have interrupted that um, those triggers and if you can spend even 30 seconds to a minute focusing on your breathing do a brief scan of your body and then focus on some kind of inanimate object it, you know it can even be a pen if you don't know what else to to look at and like i said well some people will say it's ridiculous i'm not going to look at a pen but when did you really last time look at a pen look at the colors look at how it was made and when was the last time you actually just stopped and listened for a few seconds so that's mindfulness mindfulness is all about being not doing and now i want to move briefly on to um, meditation whereby i should say uh, you know, true meditation, um, you're going to ideally be going into uh, theta, have theta brainwaves. And I can tell you from experience, I've been meditating for a couple of years now. Um, but, you know, sometimes it takes me up to an hour to actually get to that spot where my brain stops because there's so much going on. You know, we know that we have around 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And you are trying to calm your brain, calm your mind to focus on your breath. It takes practice. It's also really important to understand it's not what's happening on the outside. Now, several years ago, I was one of those people who thought meditation must be joking, not going to sit there with my legs crossed and my hands in the air on a mountain somewhere. Um, but the more research the more learning i've done also you know that the science around meditation somebody asked me um you know but isn't meditation a kind of a, a religious or, or a spiritual thing and yes of course in some cultures it, it is uh, but in in between times the 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 science about how meditation really can contribute to your well-being is so overwhelming you know this theory that my brain can trigger that stress response very very quickly therefore if i can slow down those synaptic connections it must be possible for me to relearn or learn something different to be able to trigger a different kind of response so that when you understand that meditation slowing down it's a what about what is happening on the inside what is happening on the inside of your beautiful brain so um, let's just do a few minutes um, doing a micro meditation, although, of course, in reality, this is not a meditation, but it is about calming you down, helping you feel better about who you are and um, giving your brain, your mind space to um, to relax, to calm down, to come out of that high beta state, potentially into a little bit um, of um, of alpha. So you start to feel good again so for any type of meditation unlike mindfulness please do close your eyes you want to um, to the extent possible go within and lose your senses about what's what's going on outside if you keep your eyes open meditation doesn't work with your eyes open <laughs> well there is uh, some research going on but that's for another day so close your eyes Again, make sure you're sitting comfortably, feet flat on the floor. And when you begin the, uh, to feel the anxiety, the tension, the stress starting to rise, put one hand on your chest, put your left hand over your heart and put one hand on your stomach. Now there is a theory um, scientists tend to disagree that there is also a brain in our gut as well and there there is no doubt that what is happening in our gut is is very very important but many many people do feel upset or anxiety or stress they tend to feel it in their stomach as well so rest one hand over your heart and one hand on your stomach and again with your eyes closed i want you to start breathing slowly focus on your chest focus on your heart and focus on your tummy so as you breathe in very slowly through your nose 
and out through your mouth. Focus on that breath coming into your body. And exhale again. Now with your eyes still closed, begin to think about good things. Words can be incredibly powerful. One of the things I like to say to myself in this type of a micro meditation is, I bless myself with love. Now again, I know that there are many people who will feel uncomfortable saying this to themselves. And it's because in general, we're not very good at being kind to ourselves. That imposter syndrome is present in so many, you know, oh, goodness sake, pull yourself together. Don't be so daft. You know, other people can do it. Why can't you? So as you have your hand on your heart and you're breathing slowly, either under your breath or just think it, I like to say it out loud. I bless myself with love. And I'm still breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth. You can say, I bless myself with kindness. I bless myself with serenity. I bless myself with calm. If you don't want to use the word bless, you can say, I inhale calm. And after you've done that for a few breaths, so then you want to move over to, I inhale calm. I exhale stress. Now again, if you can do that for 30 seconds, ideally this, you know, if you, if you really are feeling the tension and the anxiety, one or two minutes, you will find that you feel surprisingly better afterwards, surprisingly more calm, even as I'm just doing this now, explaining it to you. I feel less stressed. My speech has slowed down. It feels good to slow down. It feels good to relax. So when you can cultivate a sense of calm, if you can imagine that love coming into your heart and you're exhaling any anxiety or tension, you'll begin to feel better. Now, you can take this um, a step further. You, we, you know, a lot of people talk about practicing gratitude and maybe that's a, a discussion um, for a, a another um, workshop or, you know, because gratitude is something I talk about in the uh, full day version of this workshop. We know that these positive words such um, as, you know, gratitude, love, calm, serenity, just the same way that, um, you know, anger, irritation, those things. Um, I don't like this person. This person is not fair. This person is not being nice to me. Just as that type of language is cr language creates the negativity. Um, in the same way, by saying I bless myself with love or um, I bless myself uh, with gratitude, you know, um, I give gratitude, I, I'm so grateful, I'm so thankful for whatever it is. You're creating an emotional response in your body as well. You're creating that you're you're having that same neurological, physical um, response again. So words are really, really important. When you pay attention to what you're saying to yourself, and you're paying attention to, um, you know, in the same way as I mentioned, the negative words in by the same token, the, the positive words can have a very big impact on how you are feeling. What else can you do? Um, well, there, you know, there are many things, emotional freedom technique, tapping, uh, putting plants in your office because nature um, is, is harmonious. Just having plants around us, being outside, maybe if you have green around you, taking your shoes off, putting your feet on the grass, great way to, to feel better. Um, one thing I like to use is a mindfulness bell. Um, so 
on the internet you know if you look up mindfulness bell this is a, a beautiful bell sound you can choose the bell sound you want and uh, you can set it for you know maybe every 30 minutes or every 60 minutes to ring on your laptop or on your telephone or whatever and just to remind you just to spend 30 seconds or a minute taking some breaths potentially closing your eyes focusing on positive words things that you want to focus on um yeah so because we do know that regular mindfulness and meditation practices they have been shown to reduce stress levels improve focus and concentration and enhance your emotional resilience and again um there's a chap joe dispenser who who does amazing work um and he says quite definitively you know if we can um trigger a stress response purely by thought then we must be able to trigger a well-being response also through thought change requires you to rewire those neural pathways and that can be hard work you are never going to completely eradicate the beliefs the habits uh, that you have just like i said you know if i was to say to you today just forget that you you you've ever learned how to read <laughs> it's pretty much impossible but what you can do is by developing new neural pathways, you can make them stronger and um, make the other ones weaker because those synaptic connections aren't happening. Those negative um, things aren't happening so much. You're focusing on the positive. And I promise you that if you can make this a habit, if you can bring this into your day uh, two or three times, you will be amazed, um, you know, in the space of a couple of weeks, you will actually notice a, a significant difference to how you are feeling. So we've talked about why and how stress develops. We've talked about how to identify your personal stress, stress triggers, why it's so important so that you can better interrupt negative reactions um, and behaviours. And I've given you some very simple basic exercises about how to introduce mindfulness and meditation into your day to reduce stress and overwhelm. If you're interested in meditation, you know, but you don't know where to start, I would, if I were you, just go onto YouTube. It's what I did. Um, I just typed in, I started off with 15 minute meditation music. Um, and that's where I started, just closing my eyes. And like I said, some days, even now, even though I've been meditating for a couple of years now, um, and I don't feel right if I haven't meditated, it has become a habit. Um, in the beginning you are fighting with your brain you're fighting with um neural pathways that say i don't want to spend time focusing on, on my breath i need to be doing xyz looking at my emails making telephone calls but you again you will find when you practice meditation mindfulness every day you will find that over time you do begin to feel better so i hope you've enjoyed uh this short uh, masterclass. as i mentioned it is a condensed version it has been a condensed version very condensed of a day line a day long workshop on meditation and mindfulness for well-being at work um, where i also do go into other techniques uh, practical techniques things that you can do very very easily um, just to bring that serenity and that calm back into your life so until we meet again stay safe stay healthy Stay fabulous. I send you all my love and bye for now.